video is about one of the forgotten actresses of the silent film era, Beatrice LaPlante. I will be reading from portions of Gloria Swanson's autobiography, Swanson on Swanson, because Beatrice LaPlante was one of the people who helped launch Gloria Swanson's career. Beatrice was born on July 23, 1896 in Faribault, Minnesota. She was an actress, known today for Hush from 1921, Rose of the West from 1919, and Dangerous Waters from 1919. She was associated with Fox Studios. She married Clyde F. Drollinger Jr. in 1920 and died in 1992 in Monrovia, California, USA. In Miss Swanson's autobiography, we see Beatrice LaPlante appear in 1918, where Miss Swanson writes, while we were shooting the final scenes of You Can't Believe Everything, I got the Kissel Coop, and Mother and I moved up in the world from St. Francis Court to Court Corinne, which was a double row of modest bungalows in a good location near the studios, full of single actresses. I had never lived around lots of women before, and it didn't take me long to realize I would not have made a good nun or a sorority sister. Teddy Sampson and Maud Wayne, with whom I had worked at Keystone, both lived there, and so did a friend of theirs named Alice Lake. Theda Barra had once lived there but didn't any longer, and an unknown young actress had recently died in one of the apartments from an abortion, paid for by D.W. Griffith. The social life of the place consisted mostly of movie gossip and parties and sunbathing. Anything that happened in the world of movies on a given day was common knowledge in Court Corinne by sundown. Probably for that reason, the two women I liked most there were Sylvia Joslin, a quiet divorcee who was also an artist, and an unsuccessful actress named Beatrice LaPlante from Toronto. So we believe that Beatrice LaPlante was born in Minnesota, but according to Miss Swanson, she remembered her born in Toronto. She was also not entirely an unsuccessful actress. She had starred in several silent films. Bea LaPlante lived with her sister, also an unsuccessful actress, but she spent more time in our bungalow than in theirs. She had played in two white slavery pictures and had not worked since. Remember, white slavery was a term for sex trafficking at the time. She became another June Walker for me, and Mother doted on her as she had doted on my friend June. Bia was a perfectly marvelous human being. She was amusing, intelligent, and feisty, the kind of person you feel good having around. I determined that as long as the sun was shining at me at Triangle Film Studios, I would try to get Bia to work there. I took her to the studio with me for a whole day, posing her here and there so people would notice her and introducing her to all the directors I knew, but nobody made the slightest move to hire her, not even film director and producer Jack Conway for my sake. Jack did, however, like her as a person and see in her the perfect opportunity for chances for him and me to be together. He invited both of us to go duck hunting on the flats around Ventura with him and a friend the following Sunday. The friend's name was John Gilbert, who Jack told me was almost as unsuccessful as B. He had played bit parts and wanted to be a director. Jack said he would like to use him as his assistant and teach him directing before he got depressed and left pictures altogether. Bia thought John Gilbert was terribly attractive, but he didn't seem the least bit interested in her except in a friendly way. Compared with Jack Conway, I found him totally boring. But if Bia liked him, I thought, a day of duck hunting might not be too bad, particularly if it gave me a chance to see Jack Conway for once in real life, relaxed, away from the studio. We don't see that Bia was able to attain any work at Triangle. Almost immediately, Triangle Film Studios began to publicize Gloria Swanson's pictures in all the papers. Teddy Sampson ran over from her bungalow to show me the first notice that appeared. It was on the Society page. It said, Gloria Swanson will have the starring role in her next film, You Can't Believe Everything, with Jack Richardson and Daryl Foss. Just one line, no mention of director Jack Conway. I was disgusted. 
All the girls at Court Corinne began to watch me with new eyes. They must have thought if lightning could strike a little shrimp with a turned up nose and horse teeth and a mole on her chin, it could strike anywhere. I instantly became for them someone they should know. Four or five a day on the average, they came over to show me clippings or invite me to parties. Only Bia LaPlante had any idea that the very mention of triangle was enough to drive me up the wall. I didn't know what to do until my mother married another man and moved to a big house on Kinsley Avenue, and Bia's sister gave up for good on Hollywood and moved back to Toronto. I told Bia that since I now had a contract and nothing but money, I was moving out of Court Corinne and taking her with me. You can be my secretary, my dependent, anything you want. Just call a real estate agent and get us out of here, I said. A beautiful house turned up on Harper Avenue that belonged to the distinguished stage actor Tyrone Powers Sr. It was expensive, but it was beautifully furnished with wonderful grounds all around. So I said to Bia, let's take it. Why not? If I run myself into debt, maybe they'll fire me. Get a maid. We had wonderful times in the place. It was like a big dollhouse, a ridiculous toy. It was perfect for parties, and we opened it up several times during the war, this was World War I, to soldiers and sailors stationed in Los Angeles. Bea took charge of the place as well as looking after all my personal affairs. Gloria Swanson would have had a really difficult time in her Cecil B. DeMille movies without Bea handling everything from mail to household duties to even autographed pictures. Her father, Gloria Swanson's father, then decided to visit her when he was on leave from World War I. He was an officer in the United States Army. Swanson remembered. He looked thin and peaked, and his eyes were red and tired. He seemed ten years older, not five. She hadn't seen him for five years. As soon as we got to the house, he had a large drink and excused himself to get ready for dinner. He stayed in his room for over an hour. At dinner, he was polite and attentive, and Bia took up any slack in the conversation with stories about Count Court Corinne and the rest of my past that she shared with me. He said very early that he thought he would finish the wine and go to bed. The trip to California had tired him. When he had gone upstairs, I asked Bia if he seemed all right to her. She knew what I meant, of course, because we had discussed my absent father many times, and Bia was also a trained nurse. I don't think his drinking is the worst of it, she said. What do you mean? You think there's something else? She nodded. What they used to call the army disease, she said, what we now refer to as morphine addiction. What's that? Swanson asked. I could be wrong, but judging from the way he acts, I think he's also taking some kind of narcotic. Maybe it's only one of those stimulants they take in the tropics, but it's something. After that, I hardly slept at all. I lay awake trying to think what I could say to him and what I should do for him. I knew nothing at all about drug addiction. I only knew that I would probably break his heart and destroy his self-respect if I ever mentioned it. But he was so young to waste away, I kept thinking, and the more I thought about it, the more helpless I felt. However, Gloria didn't end up doing anything for her father. Instead, she started spending time with an older man, Herbert Somborn, and she wanted to trust him to take care of her affairs. She believed that Somborn was very wealthy due to family connections in the area, and so she was spending more and more time with this man. The sudden rush of publicity from her movie Male and Female, which you can watch a review of on my channel, affected Swanson's friends and family, as well as herself. Bea LaPlante, her companion and pal, was soon transformed into a drudge, answering the phone, taking messages, sorting mail, clipping and filing the endless interviews. She never complained, but I felt terribly guilty nevertheless. LaPlante was living with Swanson, presumably for a discounted rate or for free, and there's no record of Swanson having paid her beyond that. She confided to Bay about her romance with Herbert K. Somborn, and... Um, Bea was supportive of it. However, we did see that Herbert did consider Bay for a part in one of his pictures. I don't know if she ever got it. I don't know if that was one of the films she started in the early 20s. But after Herbert married Swanson, Bea LaPlante shut up the house on Harper Avenue and moved to Pasadena to be near friends she had there. Only after had she gone did Swanson realize how much she had taken off, my, off, her, off her shoulders, and this is from Swanson's point of view. 
She had answered the phone, made appointments, and sorted and answered my mail for me. Alone in the Alexandria Hotel after Somborn left for New York, I was appalled at the boxes of letters and telegrams of congratulations that the studio forwarded to me every morning. As more and more people learned where I was living, the hotel switchboard was also flooded with calls. There was no way I could hire and train a secretary because I had never thought to ask Bea how she organized things. And I knew besides that my husband would find me one when he returned. In the meantime, I was happy to start filming again a few days after he left and escaped the growing stacks of mail. When Swanson telegrammed to her husband to ask for things, she referred to him as daddy. And she talks about this in her autobiography where she says, For years I dreamed of having someone I could trust and lean on. Whatever you say, daddy, I said. So we see Swanson in this period of her life moving away from her father, who she knew had issues from World War I, and moving closer to a man she would ultimately end up divorcing. What happened to Beatrice LaPlante? There's really not much of a record. We know that she married Clyde Francis Drawlinger in 1920, shortly after her stint with Swanson, and so it seems like she was looking for stability as well. He registered for military service in 1920, and then Clyde Francis Drollinger married another woman, named, another woman named Lois in 1927. He died in September 1959 in Los Angeles, California, and he's buried at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale in L.A. Now we turn to the other LaPlantes. We know that Beatrice LaPlante had a sister in the area, and I'm wondering if Swanson confused this with one of the cousins LaPlante that were also living in Los Angeles and also actresses. Violet LaPlante was born in 1908, and she was also known as Violet Avon. She was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, not Minnesota, which we know was the birthplace of Beatrice LaPlante. Violet was the younger sister of future Hollywood star, star Laura LaPlante and started acting in the early 1920s, adapting her surname to LaPlante like her sister. Were the other LaPlantes encouraged by Beatrice LaPlante, who was living a relatively stable lifestyle as long as she was employed by Swanson? It's not clear. Violet's first film was in 1924, starring opposite Buddy Roosevelt in Battling Buddy. She starred in four films in 1924. The following year, she made just one film, but was included in the Wampus Baby Stars. Baby Star was a common term for starlet. Her sister, Laura, was a 1923 Wampus Baby Star. Despite this title, she never achieved the same level of success as her sister. In 1926 and 1927, she starred in only one film for each year, then in 1928, she managed to star in two films. I don't know if she was able to use Beatrice LaPlante's connections. I don't know if they were even related, but the fact that there were all these LaPlantes acting in Los Angeles at the same time, and we have reference to a sister in Gloria Swanson's autobiography, seems indicative to me. Violet LaPlante's career ended before the advent of sound films, and her last role was in the 1928 film How to Handle Women. She died in 1984. Her sister, Laura LaPlante, was born in 1904. She was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and her father taught dancing. After her parents were divorced, her mother took Laura and her sister, Violet, to live in San Diego. In her teens, Laura stayed with a cousin named Mary McMahon in Hollywood during a summer vacation and replied to a newspaper ad asking for children for moving pictures, and she was hired. Laura LaPlante made her acting debut at age 15, and in 1923, she was named as one of that year's Wampus Baby Stars. During the 1920s, she appeared in more than 60 films. Her early films include Big Town Roundup with cowboy star Tom Mix, the serials Perils of the Yukon of 1922, Around the World in 18 Days from 1923, and several movies with Hoot Gibson. The majority of the films starring LaPlante from 1921 to 1930 were made for Universal Pictures. This is in contrast to Beatrice LaPlante who was linked to Fox and Triangle Film Studios. 
During this period, Laura LaPlante was the studio's most popular star, an accomplishment duplicated only by Deanna Durbin years later, and she almost always enjoyed top billing. She worked for 37 years straight, from 1920 until 1957, in film. Her best-remembered film is arguably the classic The Cat and the Canary from 1927, but she achieved acclaim for Skinner's dress suit from 1926 and the 1929 part sound Showboat, adapted from the novel of the same name by Edna Ferber. Although this last film was an adaptation of the novel and not of the famous musical play adapted from the 1926 novel, some songs from the play were included in the film. LaPlante did not sing in the movie. Her singing was dubbed by Eva Olivetti, which was one of the earliest examples in which this dubbing was done in a movie. A scene of LaPlante in Showboat was one of the earliest scenes broadcast on British television. She made her last appearances for Universal in the Technicolor musical King of Jazz, and we see this harking back to Beatrice's LaPlante, Beatrice LaPlante's um, showing in another King of Jazz in the 1920s. So again, we're seeing these interesting coincidences if they were not related. Laura LaPlante appeared in God's Gift to Women in 1931 and Arizona co-starring alongside a young John Wayne. In 1934, she married film executive Irving Asher and essentially didn't have to work as hard from then onwards. After joining the staff of Warner Brothers, Irving Asher was sent to England as the managing director of the Warner subsidiary Teddington Studios. He is credited for discovering Errol Flynn when he was a young unknown actor who was hanging around Teddington Studios looking for a way into the movies. Asher produced Murder at Monte Carlo, which is now lost, and he went to join Alexander Corda's London Film Productions where he worked on the 1939 epic The Four Feathers. Asher returned to Hollywood after this to work as a producer for Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer where he earned his only Academy Award nomination for the 1941 film Blossoms in the Dust. However, he was well liked by his colleagues and thought financially secure and so he was made head of production for 20th Century Fox. Laura LaPlante accompanied her husband to Teddington Studios and her arrival coincided with an attempt to make more expensive productions. She starred in Man of the Moment with Douglas Fairbanks Jr. She appeared in a West End play, playing the lead in Admirals All. She was briefly considered to replace Myrna Loy in the Thin Man series when Loy thought about leaving, but Loy stayed on and LaPlante never got another chance like that. 1957's film Spring Reunion was her last. In 1954, we see LaPlante on film for the last time, making a guest appearance on Groucho Marx's quiz show, You Bet Your Life. In this episode, LaPlante discussed numerous topics, including her husband, Irving Asher, who had just lost a lot of weight and completed the film Elephant Walk with Elizabeth Taylor. She was doing well financially and asked that her winnings go to the Motion Picture Relief Fund, so she was concerned about actresses doing less well than herself. In the mid-1980s, LaPlante was brought on stage in a wheelchair to wave to the crowd at the event Night of a Hundred Stars, some footage of which is available from Turner and online. Laura LaPlante died in 1996 at the age of 91 in Woodland Hills, California. Her husband, Irving, had died more than 10 years prior. Her death was due to Alzheimer's disease. Despite conflicting rumors about her interment at El Camino Memorial Park in San Diego, she was actually cremated by the Valhalla Memorial Park Cemetery in North Hollywood and her ashes were scattered at sea. One can recognize why it may be so confusing because there were multiple LaPlantes working in Hollywood for decades. We also see that Laura LaPlante 
was recognized in a road sign. There is Laura LaPlante Drive in Agora Hills, California. I think this is really important to mark because we're seeing how these largely forgotten women made a mark on the landscape and they were remembered by many people enough to have roads named after them. I don't know how Beatrice LaPlante survived after leaving Gloria Swanson. It's clear from the rest of Gloria Swanson's autobiography that she did not invite Beatrice LaPlante to her future parties. She did not invite her to her life in France. And so it's something that is very interesting for us to look at and evaluate all of these feminine, you know, lost voices from Hollywood in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s.